with us today, Peter Wolfhorst from Penn State Extension uh, to be talking to us about all things drinking water. So I'm going to hand it over to him and we're going to get started. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, thank you, Devin. Let me um, share my screen. The other thing, uh, we're going to have some poll questions. So if you fill out the poll questions, you're going to have to um, minimize it once you fill it out. Um, let me, I have two monitors so I can do this, look at one. So um, welcome everybody. And I know we have Rachel uh, on here, the watershed specialist from the conservation district. Uh, one of the programs that Extension does to incorporate volunteers is our master well owner network program. And I know Rachel completed the training for that. So Rachel's another resource uh, if you have questions about drinking water um, regarding uh, any information. So we're gonna talk about taking action to protect your drinking water, private water wells and springs. And the last uh, statement there, management and protection is voluntary. And let me know if, you, if you're having issues hearing me. I know in the past, my headset might have broken up a little but hopefully you can hear me uh, let, through the chat, let, let us know and I might have to take it off if I'm Break, breaking up too much, but the bottom statement there, protection and management is voluntary. So in Pennsylvania, we'll talk about this. There are no uh, regulations for private water systems. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the presentation. So let me get to my next slide about extension. Uh, as Devin said, I work for Penn State Extension. I'm in the Milford office, but right now I'm home. Uh, we're shut down due to the pandemic through the rest of the year. We've been doing this since the middle of March. But before the pandemic, we uh, did a lot of face-to-face -face meetings and workshops and seminars. We also have fact sheets. Uh, you'll see at the end of today's uh, presentation, a website that has a lot of our fact sheets and online courses and videos concerning private water systems. Um, and then we do webinars like this that we've been doing for years, but um, that's just some of the ways that we educate people using the research information from our land grant institutions such as Penn State and others throughout the country. Uh, this is our affirmative action statement. Uh, we are providing education for all populations, all audiences, and we have to let people know that uh, we cannot discriminate in who we deliver our material to. So our objectives for this morning is to look at the types of private water supplies and the construction of those along with some common water quality problems you might experience. And then if you have those problems, what are some ways to take care of them, either through water treatment or other processes? And going in conjunction with that, understanding the importance of protecting and maintaining your private water supply, because you are your own water treatment operator at home. So private water systems here in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, this is a map showing all the wells drilled. It's a little outdated, there's a lot more. We probably are closer to 4 million residents that are getting their water supply from a private water system. We're on a, one of two states, the other one being Alaska, that had no regulations. And we'll talk about if in lieu of that, where you might have some regulations locally. In Northeastern Pennsylvania, about 35% of the homes have a private water system. There is, uh, through studies and surveys that we've done through our research, high rate of contamination of these private water systems. And one of the things that you hopefully have never experienced is some businesses prey on uninformed homeowners. They might come and ask you to test their water at your house, or you take a kit from a Home Depot or whatever and you test your water. Uh, but especially those that do it at the house, they might say, well, you have X, Y, and Z, and this is what you need to treat X, Y, and Z, and you really don't know. Um, because when you do water testing, as we'll talk about, we want to rec we recommend you do it through a certified lab. And the last bullet is no ownership of water. Uh, the water is owned by the Commonwealth. Uh, you're just allowed to use it. So if there is somebody near you who puts in a, a, a bigger pump, um, and pulls more water out, really you have little recourse since you don't own the water. Um, you might have to take legal action uh, to, to protect yourself, but you don't own the water. And so at the bottom are three schematics or pictures. One is a well, the second one is a cistern, and then the third one is a spring. And I think, 
Devin, somebody wants to get into the room. I don't know if you got that. I got that on my screen. So when we talk about private water systems, we're using basically, other than cisterns, groundwater. And so wells and springs, two of the three types of private water systems utilize groundwater. Pennsylvania, we're very blessed to receive abundant precipitation. Unfortunately, this summer, we just had a drought watch for 16 counties because of lack of rainfall. But we get about 40 inches on average. Um, about 12 to 15 inches of those that rainfall or snow melt is what we call recharge. It soaks into the ground, infiltrates, percolates, down into the groundwater going through the upper layer of the soil before it hits the groundwater aquifers down below. The other parts of that is evaporation. It's all part of the water hydraulic cycle. Uh, right now, if it rains, you're gonna have some capture by leaves. Uh, because it's summertime, some of it's gonna evaporate then back in um, great uh, rain events in the future. So we have groundwater flowing and it flows similar to what we see on the surface of the landscape. It'll flow from up gradient to down gradient. So in this schematic, groundwater is flowing towards a stream. And a lot of base flow of streams is groundwater. So during low rain events like this summer, uh, you'll still see some flow in some streams because they're being fed by groundwater. If a groundwater then doesn't go to a stream, but then leaves uh, the surface outside of a stream, that's what we call a spring. It comes to the surface of the land. Uh, in this schematic, there's an impervial layer, which is uh, an aquitard that separates two aquifers. Uh, one of the things that sometimes you might have heard is artesian wells. That's where there's an aquifer that's between two in, impermeable layers and it's trapped there. And that's what we call an artesian well. So groundwater feeds the streams and, and our springs, and that's where we get our water supply. Uh, if you drive along 84 towards Scranton, you might see the rock cuts. And this is where water is traveling in these aquifers. You see these fractures in this limestone, or in the case of 84, be a shale formation. You'll see these stone uh, cracks, and that's where a lot of our, that's where our water is traveling. So it looks like it's tight bedrock, but that's where the water is flowing underground in our bedrock and in our uh, aquifer. So groundwater, as I said, flows underground. It, it, some of it gets trapped through a saturated rock. Some is um, then in the, in the top part of the surface or below the surface. If you go, the one aquifer we have here in, Pen in Pike County is along the Delaware River. It's an unconsolidated aquifer. Uh, it's very shallow and you can easily get water, but if you do have low precipitation and get into some dry conditions, that water table will easily go down. So you might, if you have a 40 foot well, you might lose water during a, a, a drought. The rest of the water in the aquifers here in, the con in Pike County and the rest of the Commonwealth are in bedrock. And you can see those cracks. So it's uh, flowing through the ground. Some of it's used to be used by the trees right now, you know, during the rain events because of their um, trees being active now with leaves and they're taking it up for, to, to make sure they can survive. But then the rest, some of it will go and recharge into the ground. And it's captured in these bedrocks through these cracks or if it's in that unconsolidated aquifer, there's little capillaries in that unconsolidated rock. So if you live between Milford and Madame Morris along the Delaware, uh, you can get water pretty easily. Now you don't have to drill very deep. Uh, but like I said, during drought conditions, uh, you're gonna have that water table recede or go down and you might run out of water. And that happened to some friend of ours or somebody we know outside Milford and Moon Valley last year, uh, the water table lowered and their well wasn't very deep and they lost water. So that's where we're getting our water for our springs and our wells. We have various aquifers uh, that are in Pennsylvania and the most common one is that sand and gravel, which you can see, and I don't know if I can show it on my little cursor there. That's right along the Delaware, one along the Lackawaxen. The other aquifer we have here is sandstone and shale. And you can see some of the characteristics of these different types of aquifers, moderate hardness, but uh, hard water is using a carbonate aquifer, limestone out, and that's a lot of the central Pennsylvania and in the crystalline down in the um, southeast part of the, the Commonwealth. So you can see how far you have to go to get water. The average well is about 150 feet here in the Commonwealth. Um, the other things related to these aquifers is the abundance or quantity, and you can see in the crystalline aquifer, uh, it's more or less five to 25 gallons per minute when you 
get a water supply for your home, we'd like to see you average five gallons per minute to be able to supply the needs for your household on a daily basis. So these are the different types of aquifers. And each have characteristics that relate to the quality of the water you're getting out of your tap, and we'll talk about that. Since this groundwater moves, it can be susceptible to pollution. This is just a schematic of uh, the back 40 where somebody would dump stuff. Um, and then we have barrels, and if there's any material in there that are carcinogen or pollutants, those things can break down and get into our water supply. So you can see in a schematic that whatever was in these barrels, whatever pollutants were in there, were seeping into the ground and getting into the different aquifers. The problem with groundwater pollution is it's much more difficult to treat surface water, you can pull it out, treat it. Uh, but groundwater is much more difficult if you pollute your groundwater. So we try and encourage people to avoid that and not pollute their groundwater. Uh, it's much more difficult to try and treat it. In fact, out in Center County near Penn State, there is a spring that for many years uh, was polluted by a local chemical company and it's gone down over the years, but they've had to pump a lot of water out treat it and re-put that water back into the ground. So that's a very expensive proposition. So we try and encourage people to be careful. We'll talk about what that means in a few minutes around their water supply to prevent it from having to get contaminated, uh, especially things that are carcinogenic um, that can affect your health. So at this point, we have a poll question. So Devin, if you could pull up the poll question, what type of water supply do you have? Is it a drilled well? with casing? Is it a hand dug well, which is normally below the ground? It might be a little bit above a spring. Cistern, which I didn't really talk about. We'll talk about that and see if anybody, public water or not sure. So I think the, we'll give it another, if everybody could vote, that would be great. I think we have 13 people that are viewing, if they could all vote and then we could shut the poll down. You got two more. With this small crowd, hopefully we can get everybody to vote. Okay, one more. Somebody didn't vote? If not, we'll, won't belabor the point if you just want to shut the poll down. Yep, I'm going to end <laughs> About, the poll. Yeah, and, if, um, and you have to, like I said, you have to minimize the poll. So as you can see, about two-thirds of you are on a drilled well. Uh, lot, uh, some are on the other three. Would you like me to share walk. with everyone? Yeah, if you can. Yeah, and about three people had public water and then one is not sure. So I'm going to shut that. I want to, I'll stop the share results and I'll shut my poll down. Okay, I'll go back. So you can see that we'll talk about these different types of systems. Okay. So look at a drilled well. So this is a schematic of a drilled well. You can see the casing sticking above the ground. Um, and when the pump is not working, and you can see what they do is they put the casing in, we'll talk about why that's important. And then there's a submersible pump to access the water. The casing goes for so many feet, basically it's put in there to protect from flow coming horizontally from the ground. So, so when it rains and the water recharges and goes through the soil, if you don't have a casing, some of that water could then percolate or travel to your borehole and that water could have some potential contaminants. A lot of those might get, especially bacteria contamination, a lot gets filtered as it goes through the soil and gets down into the aquifer. So the casing provides support for the borehole one and also protects that water just below the surface of land from getting into your borehole and getting your water supply. So below the casing, then we open up, continue drilling the well. We have this opening. It's usually a six inch casing. And the water that we use every day is stored in that borehole. And about a six inch well with 100 feet of water contains about 150 gallons. So in there is a submersible pump. It's usually above the borehole bottom. It's not directly on the bottom. And when it's not being used, water is not being used in the house, we have what we call a static water level. So your pump is not working. This happens overnight when you go to bed. You're not using water. Your water tank is filled up and your pump is off. So you have a static level. Once you start using water by washing, taking a shower, doing dishes, flushing the toilet, brushing your teeth, when you start using water and have the pump kicked in is what we call a drawdown. 
And so the water draws down because it's being sucked out of the hole, out of the borehole into your house. And we consider that a sustained yield is how much water can we pump over a long time. So when I say that you would like to at least have five gallons per minute of water access in this borehole uh, being pumped in your house because of the needs you have daily for water, that's the minimum. My well, I think it's about 25 to 30 gallons per minute. So it's a nice yield. And so then once we stop using the pump and time using water at night, it goes back to that static level. So when they do a well, when they drill a well, they usually test to see what the quantity of that well is, of that water supply, so you can have enough water. Like I said, you know, you know, the average is 150. People say, well, let's go deeper. The issue with going deeper is it's more expensive for you. And also there are some quality issues the deeper you go with total dissolved solids, the more and the problem with that. We uh, talk about there, we yes. have a quick question. Um, someone wanted to know about the public water in uh, Milford Borough. He says, I understand the public water comes from two springs. Uh, yes. Are you going to be going over more of that in the presentation? Well, I can I'll talk a little bit about springs. Springs, like I said, are water that comes to the surface. Um, right. And I know Milford Borough has two reservoirs that are spring fed. Uh, the issue with that is they now have to filter that water because of Giardia and Cryptosporidium, two ones I think of. Uh, there are two organisms that can get into surface water and cause problems for people. In fact, Cryptosporidium, several years ago in the city of Milwaukee, had an, I think 400 people died from the Cryptosporidium. So I know as a sur they're considered a surface water, so they have to filter, uh, but they are spring fed. And I was gonna talk about spring. So I don't know if you had any specific questions, maybe that individual can put in the chat box if he has any questions about that type of water supply, but it is spring fed. And so they have to have a filtering system to remove crypto and spritium and giardia, as well as chlorinated as a public water system. So that, that was an added expense for those, for them to install that. So, so we talk about springs for individual purposes and I have a couple slides about that that I'll talk about. And if I don't answer his questions during those slides, you can answer the, uh, ask them again in the chat box. So we talk about drilled wells. There are things that we like to see of these wells and make sure that they're properly constructed. And without any kind of private water regulations here in the Commonwealth, fewer than 20% of home and farm wells have all five of these. I'm one of those 80%. I don't have, uh, have all five of these. The first one though is at least casing 12 inches above the ground. I violate that, mine's probably about eight inches. The reason we want to have that is you want to be able to access the well if you need to chlor a shock chlorinated or, or have to replace your pump. And we like to see it 12 feet above so um, you can get proper access and know where it is. Uh, the second one is casing the bedrock. Uh, we like to see the well driller at least cased to the bedrock. So we want to keep all those water from the soil above the bedrock, possibly getting into the um, water hole, the borehole and getting possibly bacteria into your, your home. Usually the soil will do a good job filtering that. Uh, if you don't, if, if the bedrocks, if you're really deep to the bedrock, we recommend a lot of, a minimum about 30 to 40 feet of casing. The third one is one that really never happens too much. And that's a grout seal. And you can see in the lower right picture, these well drillers are putting a grout seal. When you drill a well, they uh, have a thin little space because the well rig that drills is wider than the casing. The casing is usually six inches. So there's kind of a thin little annular space on the exterior of the casing. And that could be a conduit for water from the surface getting down into your groundwater, into your water supply. And that can carry things like bacteria and other contaminants. You cannot retrofit a well with grout. You have to do it when the well is drilled since it's not required. Um, most well drillers won't do it. There's about an added $500 expense, five to $600 expense. The fourth one is sloping it away. You don't want to have your well casing in a depression where water can accumulate and uh, from a rain event and potentially carry especially bacteria. And if that water then uh, congregates or accumulates around your casing it, without grout, potential is there for having that water from the surface getting down into your groundwater. And the fifth one is a sanitary wall cap. 
This is a picture of a well on the left with one and then the cap independent of the casing. This one is very important and if you don't have one of these, I'd recommend you put one on the top of your well casing. Because uh, with a standard well cap, you can get critters up underneath there that um, can carry bacteria or E. coli, which is uh, the bacteria found in the gut of warm-blooded animals like mice. So these are things that we encourage people when they're drilling well to have. If you haven't drilled a well and you anticipate drilling one in the future, you can do all five of these, including the grout. If you currently have a well like I do, you can't put the grout back in, but hopefully you have these other ones on your well. Because like I said, without construction standards in Pennsylvania, you're not gonna have all these. Now there are other ways that that happens. We'll talk about that later. So springs, yes. Here we question. have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Judy would like to know um, if you recommend self-testing your well, and if so, how often? I don't know what she means by self-testing. Does she mean water testing or just checking out the well to make sure that everything is good with it? We recommend you inspect it period uh, periodically. You can hire somebody, and I think I have a slide later on. Uh, some and I, Somebody asked me about this the other day, and I'm not sure who locally has one of these, but some well drillers, I'm not aware of any in, in Pike County, we recommend taking a camera and running a camera down the casing. And I think I have a picture of a, of a casing that had problems with corroding and water was getting in from the soil on the outside of the casing. So, you know, if you want to do that, that's, that would be one. That's a little bit of an expense to hire somebody uh, to do that. She says water testing. She meant Okay. Water. Well, we're going to talk about that. So okay. just hang on to that thought. And if I don't answer her question related to that, um, she can ask me one. After. But we'll talk about water testing. Sounds good. Uh, so springs, springs are more susceptible to drought because as we talked about, if you don't have a lot of precipitation, they can dry up easily with that groundwater is not coming to the surface. They're more susceptible to bacteria and other surface activities. So if you do use a spring, and I don't think anybody answered a spring in, in the, the poll question, but you want to have a box around it. You want to at least have a sediment filter and a chlorination system or a UV light or some disinfection system because you're going to have bacteria. In fact, we did a study many years ago of roadside springs and there's one over in 50, Route 55 between Barryville and Eldred near where I live and people go there and they um, fill up their jugs. Um, uh, most of those have coliform because you don't know what's on where those springs are coming from. A lot of them, some of them have E. coli. So uh, we don't encourage people to fill up their jugs for their water supply at a spring at a park or some spring um, because they're more prone to uh, bacterial contamination. So you want to have a spring box, you want to be able to empty and clean it. And as I said, most of them are going to require disinfection. And you can see the lower right, a poorly sealed spring where you could have critters get in there and critters can carry the coliform bacteria on their, on their surface. And if you have warm blooded animals, their droppings could be in there and they would have E. coli. So when we want to properly locate our water supply for a well or even a spring, you want to potentially, you want to keep things away from it that might be contaminants. So the best scenario is to look upslope more than downslope because as I said, groundwater is going to flow in a similar path of surface water. So anything upslope has a potential of being a contaminant. Not to say that downslope doesn't, especially if it's in close proximity to your well, uh, but you want to be more concerned upslope. Now, if you're flat, and we'll have a slide of that, you want to look at 100 feet around your well casing. So you know, identify where your well casing is, protect 100 feet around it from any potential contaminants. So don't use pesticides. Uh, normally your own lot septic system should be away, 100 feet away, but you want to be concerned. In the case here in the upper left photograph, it's close to a highway, but that's a state highway and in, up in Pennsylvania and we get a lot of snow, they're going to treat it. So potentially there could be some chlorides and sodium at certain times of the year getting into that well. Uh, also, there could be a crash, a vehicle with some uh, truck carrying something. Uh, I know last week on Twin Lakes Road, uh, a truck crashed. Uh, and if that was a truck carrying some type of uh, oil supply for propane or, so or something, some material that was hazardous, 
If you it's right near your well casing, then potentially that could then seep into the ground and get into the groundwater. You want to be away from your neighbor's wells uh, and property lines and other potential contaminant sources. So 100 feet is kind of the standard um, distance that we use. And the reason we use that is that has the potential for getting into the ground and getting into your water supply. So wellhead protection for community systems like Milford Water Supply, they have a whole study they did. But for an individual home, 100 feet, but just knowing that the erection of groundwater follows a similar path as surface water. So if your well has a high up gradient, that's gonna be more important to protect that area from keeping potential contaminant sources out of that area to get into your water supply. Uh, the further you go, there's less impact. So when people call me and they wanna test their water, and they say, I like to test for everything, or they don't know what to test for, we, Stand by your well and look around you and whatever's in close proximity, if there are some type of uses there that potentially can contribute a, a contaminant to your water supply, you want to test for that. You know, if it's a couple miles away, there's less of a risk of that material getting into the ground. If it gets in the groundwater, getting into to your water supply. So you really want to learn to be more concerned about the immediate vicinity of uh, any contaminants. You don't want to tie your dog and leave it there all day. That's not wellhead protection. Uh, that dog could then relieve itself, and then you have a direct source of contamination, a bacteria source getting into your water supply. So that's not wellhead protection, putting your dog guarding your well protection is keeping things out. And this schematic here uh, shows a well on an agriculture area where they put a fence. And what happened is the livestock were curious on the farm and they gravitated or towards the well, the fence around the well, and you can see where they trampled down. Getting to there, they might have used, had to go to the bathroom and deposited. So there's a potential contaminant source, as well as break, uh, putting down with their footprints the ground around it. Uh, there's little infiltration of any kind of rainfall, and it might accumulate towards that well because of that uh, compacted soil right around the well. So that's that, not a fence, just keeping things out and looking at a 100 foot minimum, not allowing things that potentially could be contaminants in close proximity to your casing or your spring. Um, limit activities near the well. You don't want to use any kind of fertilizers, pesticides. It's a no-no. In this case, there's a standard wall cap on this, on this casing. So keep all potential contaminant activities. Now, unfortunately, well, unfortunately for me, my wall casing is less than 100 feet from my house and my driveway, but that's what I inherited when I purchased the home. Hopefully your cases, your casing are far enough away from your house to limit any kind of potential contaminant getting into your water supply. We talk about well caps. The left schematic is a standard well cap. The bolts are into the casing. There's a thin little space. Let me look at my cursor. Right underneath the casing is a thin little space. It's amazing what critters will get up under that wall cap through that thin little space. Earwigs, spiders, mice. Mice love to live down in wall casing. It's a uniform temperature. They have the pitless adapter normally below the surf, below there, right in the casing. They can build their nest. Uh, in fact, my water associate, Brian Swistock, tells a story that he uh, moved into a home that had a private well and they kept the breaker, kept shutting off for the well pump. And here, there were mice in there chewing on the wires, and when it zapped them and killed them, they dropped down into the well, and that shut off the power. So mice love to live down in here. Insects love to live. So if you have a standard wall cap, we recommend you put on a sanitary wall cap. Sanitary cap is two parts, and it contains a gasket, and the bolts are vertical or parallel to the casing, and it creates a seal that prevents those critters from getting up in there. You can see that here. So it's important, this is one thing you could do, they're about 50 bucks, 50 to 60 bucks. Uh, if you need to uh, know something about wiring, because you're gonna have some wiring to deal with, so if you're uncomfortable with that, a well driller or a friend you know maybe that does this can come for maybe 100 bucks or so, I'm not exactly sure, it's the average cost to replace your standard wall cap with a siren tail wall cap. Standard wall caps, unfortunately, are on about 84% of the wells. As I mentioned, there's an airspace that exists between the casing and the cap that is a conduit or a source for in insects and mice to get up underneath that cap. This lower left picture 
is a standard wall cap that was lifted up and looked at and you can see some egg masses of insects. And this did happen. Somebody in Walker Lake where I lived several years ago had a coliform contamination. We went to the house since I live in Walker Lake. We lifted up the standard wall cap and there were some egg masses. So I suspect that that's where it's coming from. So when we talk about coliform bacteria, if you do get that in your well, you might want to look at your wall cap. And if you have a standard wall cap, you want to address it by putting a sanitary wall cap. And that might be the source of your uh, insect, of your coliform bacteria. The other one is that mice living down there with the wiring, putting their nest. Uh, so standard wall caps, unfortunately, about half of them have presence of insects or rodents, which can lead to coliform and E. coli contamination. So you want to put on a sanitary wall cap. Now, the 60% of wells in Pennsylvania have one are probably because well drillers. I have one in my house. So Dave Weber, who drilled my well back in the mid 80s, used a sanitary wall cap. It's metal, aluminum. The one picture here is a plastic one. They come in different aluminum, plastic, different colors. Some counties have county health departments in the southeast part of the state. Through their permitting process of wells in those counties, you have to put on a sanitary wall cap. Here in Shola Township, where I live, we have a well ordinance we require a sanitary wall cap. So in lieu of not having any statewide regulations for private well owners, local municipalities can adopt well ordinances requiring some of these construction standards to be implemented for new wells, including sanitary wall caps. As I mentioned, they're slightly more expensive, but they're well worth the investment because of that seal and that rubber gasket, that two pot wall cap that keeps critters from getting underneath your well cap and getting into your water supply down to your casing. And that's definitely a bacterial source. We talk about wall casing, at least 12 feet above, inches above the ground. It's amazing, some of them are buried. I've been to wells, I've been into Twin Lakes a couple of times where they have wells that are buried in pits. One is even out in the middle of the yard and that's even where their tank is. And then the water gets uh, piped into the house. Uh, they're more prone to contam bacterial contamination, especially because those pits don't have that grout and water can accumulate in that pit and then carry potential bacteria sources down into the groundwater. You also want to slope the ground away from the well. You don't want to have a depression around your casing where the water can accumulate during a heavy rain event and potentially could have bacteria in that surface water getting down into your well. So that's another thing that you know, hopefully you can do with your current situation. But you know, I don't wanna get carried away. This is a picture of one that somebody was very cautious. That's too high to slope it away. You don't have to go that extreme. Uh, springs, which uh, in some parts of the Commonwealth are uh, sources of water for households, significant water sources of water. You wanna have a spring box. We have an extension fact sheet on how to put one together you want to keep insects, animals, and surface contamination out of that water supply. Interestingly enough, during Ag Progress Days a couple of day, weeks ago, we had a SE expert on water, and somebody had a spring that had crayfish in it, which is interesting, uh, which is a good thing, and that, that's good water quality, but you don't want to have crayfish. You don't have bugs. You don't want to have them in your water supply, because potentially they could have bacterial issues that you're going to get there. Um, so you want to seal your spring. Like I said, you also want to have a sediment cartridge and some type of disinfection, normally a UV light, because of the pro of spring being prone to bacteria contamination. We talked earlier about grouting. This is just another picture. It's a slurry, a bentonite slurry that's poured down that annular space on the exterior of the well casing. It rises then to the surface, usually to get it down, you know, along the casing rises to the surface, it hardens, and it provides a, a seal for any kind of water getting down through that space. But like I said, these cannot be retrofitted if um, you don't have a gel well already. It doesn't have grouting. So what are some of the, uh, some of the pictures of well constructions? Well, we have the good, which is the, the sanitary wall cap. We have the bad, which is a standard wall cap. In fact, this one, it kept falling down, the wiring, so they taped it shut. You can see then that the, there's that little space under there that the insects can get up underneath your well cap. The very bad is this pit that has cinder blocks, including a cinder block on top, not even a well cap. Uh, this pit was open, but they buried it, uh, put in some fill. 
put these cinder blocks away around it, but still potentially water can get down into that depression around that casing. This is a hand dive well that they happen then to extend uh, the casing, but it's a pit. And so you can see if water gets in there without grouting, it could carry down along that space and getting into the um, to your water supply into the groundwater. This is casing that's leaking. So water from the soil on the outside of the casing before it got to the bedrock is seeping into the well and getting into the groundwater. This is another picture of that mice living there. And that's what you want to avoid because of the E. coli potential. And then this is a standard wall cap showing insect cases, which is another potential source for coliform bacteria. So you want to try and be the good and have as many of those important construction standards that we talked about earlier. Peter, we have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone says, I have a lot of rust on the outer casing at ground level, and it's coming off the casing in flakes. Is this a cause for concern? Well, um, that means there's, I, and I don't know how old that well is, that means there's the casing is starting to corrode. Uh, that's potentially, I mean, yeah, it, it could be an issue. You're gonna get some iron, or well, not, you're gonna get some of that material in the water supply. So, uh, and she said it's on the exterior, the person said it's on the exterior. Or it's the on interior. the outer casing. Outer casing. <sighs> Potentially over time, if that continues, that casing can corrode. Uh, so you might wanna have a well driller inspect that for you and look at it and see whether you would need to replace the casing. So I don't know if the person knows who drilled the well. We have a few well drillers in the area. I can't, I can't um, recommend one. I know we have Peter Kessler and Williams well drilling and um, there's, a, and a, there's probably a few others. So you might wanna have a well driller look at that because if that's happening, then the potential is that it's corroding and you could have that picture that I just showed you of water getting in from the surface. So I would definitely have that looked at by a well driller. If it's pretty bad, see whether your casing has to be replaced. So have the water supply inspected. And this is what I talked about earlier. Like I said, keep area clear, protect from vehicles. Don't park vehicles near your well casing for extended periods of time, especially if there are leaks and things from underneath the car, the vehicle getting down onto the surface and into groundwater. You want to inspect like for damage and maybe this one that the person just asked about their casing flaking off. You might want to have that looked at by a well driller. Uh, we recommend every 10 years having some type of professional inspection that doesn't happen too much. This is a picture of Todd Giddings from Central PA running a camera down to look at the casing that cannot be seen below the ground to make sure the casing and the the well pump and the pitless adapter are all still functioning properly. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody that does that locally. And then finally, keep records, especially if you have water tests or you buy water treatment equipment, or uh, you uh, replaced your well pump, keep all those records in a handy folder uh, with you. And because, um, especially the water treatment, um, if you go to sell your house, and you have a piece of water treatment equipment, it's nice to let the person purchasing their home aware of what that piece of equipment is. So keep all those records at least, and then you could share them with, uh, if you're selling your house, or at least have information. If you have records of water testing, you can see if there's changes uh, for some of the parameters. Uh, somebody asked me this yesterday, how do I know what my well looks like? How do I know how deep the bed uh, casing is? What type of rock? How deep did they drill? What's the aquifer? Um, when they drill a well, they're supposed to complete a well log or a well completion report. If your well was done, mine was in the mid 80s, if it's done in the 70s, 60s, probably even through the 90s, a lot of times they were done with paper copies. And if you don't have, if you bought a house and have a well and you don't know where that copy is, uh, there's a way to find out. You can check with the well driller if they're still drilling wells. In my case, Dave Weber, who drilled my well, is no longer drilling wells to see if they have a copy. You could check with the municipality. This person did, but they didn't have any records. There's a source you can go online. It's called the Pennsylvania Groundwater Information System. It's through the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And we have a fact sheet on this also, but if you Google this, P-A-G-W-I-S, you'll get to their website. And you can find information about your well through this reporting system. What they're doing is they're having 
people uh, take those handwritten copies and input them into a database. Nowadays, I, well drillers are inputting this electronically for new wells. So if you have a lot of information, it's gonna make your search a lot easier. So you're gonna know your county. So you hopefully you know that what county you live in. Next piece of information to find your well log is the municipality, the township or borough. Another one is a well ID, but you probably don't know that. The other one would be a driller. If you know who the driller was, you'll get less information. So if you just do county, you're gonna get all the wells drilled in the county. If you narrow it down to municipality, you're gonna get all the wells drilled in that municipality. If you narrow it down to the well driller, you're gonna get all the wells drilled by that well driller in that municipality. And then you should be able to find your records. And I found mine through this system for my well from the mid 80s. This is a way to try and get information about what the well driller experienced in drilling the well to get that information. And you may even have uh, flow uh, yield in there, what type of gallons per minute they've got from drilling the well. So this is a system where you can get that information. And if you find it, I would copy it and put it in any records you have uh, for your private water system. Peter, we so, have another question. Sure. Um, Richard would like to know, is the depth of a well important? I believe mine is 400 feet, but I've heard others are not as deep. Well, like I said, the average depth is about 150 feet. So in Pennsylvania, you don't, depending on the aquifer is how deep. So 400 feet, is not overly, you know, deep. I mean, I've heard people go on 7,000 feet. The issue with going really deep, and it depends on the aquifer, hopefully, when we talked about those cracks in the bedrock, you want to have a well drilled to those cracks. And if you get where the cracks are intersecting each other, that's even better because you have two cracks coming together. And that's where the water is going to flow up into your home from the bedrock. So uh, when well drillers drill a well, they're, you know, they're, they're checking to see if they're, if they're hitting water. 400 feet, and I don't know, if the, and, and if it's drilled 400 feet, your pump is not going to be 400 feet. You want to have your pump a little bit above the bottom of the well because if it's too close you're going to pull up over time that borehole you're going to have frat, you know things falling off the borehole in the rock crack you know things are going to fall off pieces and they're going to accumulate at the bottom of your your well so you don't want to have your well your your well pump right above that because you don't want to pull that stuff up with your water so uh 400 feet's not that bad okay. having then, deeper well having seven and a half thousand you start getting issues with taste uh, if you really drill you drill really deep you're going to get salt you're going to get a lot of salty water and so um you're going to have high totals off solids and one of the issues with total off solids is a taste issue i was just at the ocean last week you know that's full of salt water so they, you know you can they taste that, so you, you want to avoid a taste issue, and also it's expensive. <laughs> Every foot the drill is more expensive for you to pay to drill your well. So, so around here, I, mean, I don't know. Like I said, statewide is about 150, 175 feet. I think that's what mine is. And there, you know, there's variables. There's some that are really deep, some that are shallow, like the ones along the three lane there along the Delaware. Like I said, you don't have to drill very deep in, in that aquifer to get to water. So, you know, the cost, the drip, the drip, there's a cost, but you want to make sure you get water. And then if you real, drill really deep and use that water, then you could be experiencing some uh, taste issues. The water might not taste as good because of the saltiness of it. So the second poll is, do you have a copy of your well completion report? So if you want to yep. launch that poll, we'll see if people have a copy of this report. And while we're waiting for uh, people to log their answers, um, we have a question from Pat. She wants to know how far back did the records you were speaking about on the last slide go? Well, um, that's a good question. I nowadays, from way back when, they're they're in, unfortunately they're inputting that data, is my understanding. That's probably going to take a few years. <laughs> with all the wells that were drilled. Because at one time there were paper copies. So the only way I guess you find out is if you see if your well do drilled wells in that system. I'm not quite sure. I mean, there might be some from the 60s and 70s. I know mine's there from the mid 80s. Um, probably even in the, I would imagine that somebody has a house and a water supply from the 40s, 50s. I don't, even, I don't know how many drilled wells. There might have been hand dug wells at that time. They probably just started drilling wells. So all that information has to be inputted. 
by hand into that electronic system. So uh, I think there's probably some back there, but I'm not sure how many of them are <laughs> from that far back from the 60s or 70s would be in there. It's probably not 100% of them. So Pat, you just have to try and find that information and see if your records are there. So we'll, I think we have, yeah, so, oh, about, yeah. You're in the poll, I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so you can see about 30% have a copy, a little over 38% don't. So if you don't have a copy, this is one way to get information about your well. Okay, we'll go to the next. So we talk about groundwater. There are some occurring problems with groundwater just to the nature of the rock, okay? First one is corrosive water, which I am the recipient of. This is water of an acidic nature, low pH. It's called soft water. And what the corrosive water does, it corrodes the metal pipes in your home, contributing to what we call blue-green stains, which is a sign of copper. And depending on the age of your house, you could have lead in the soldering. So it creates leaks in metal pipes, gives you a metallic taste, creates those blue-green stains. So when I bought my home back in uh, 1997, I had the blue-green stains, I had a metallic taste, and so I knew I had corrosive water. Uh, and if you have enough copper, there's health risk to you. And lead does have a health risk. And lead's not gonna show itself. My lead was right at the level, my copper was high. So corrosive water is very common in Pike County and in the Northeast uh, Pennsylvania. The second one is hard water, which is kind of the opposite. This is what we call hardness. It's calcium magnesium. Some of the symptoms might be if you do wash glass cups, clear glass, you might see a white residue, you might get some dull laundry. What happens with hardness is it creates a scale along the pipes in your home. And if that scale gets severe enough, it constricts the flow of water through those pipes. It's similar to you having cholesterol in your, in your, in your, in your, heart, in your body. It restricts the flow of water. Um, it also has an issue with sub soaping. It's hard to soap up with hard water. And also can uh, create problems with your um, water heaters. You can corrode the water heaters. We do have issues with hardness sporadically here in northeastern Pennsylvania. It's more common in a limestone formation. And if you go to central PA or if you lived in Jersey where there's limestone, hardness is an issue. But it's an aesthetic issue. Unless it gets severe enough that you know, it can cause problems with your heating system. The second one is iron, which is very common in the area. It creates those orange, red, rusty stains, metallic taste. There are two forms of iron. There's oxidized and reduced. So ox, uh, you could have clear water get exposed to um, with iron and that oxidized uh, form and then a reduced form and then it gets oxidized and it could show up in your, in your home. So you wanna make sure that you know which kind it is, but it creates problems, especially also with laundry. The, iron goes in hand with manganese, which is a black stain, metallic taste, they occur together. And uh, I know there's a well in Hemlock Farms, which has a community system. One of the wells is very high number, high levels of manganese. And some of the homes in Hemlock Farms have had issues. And I think now they've had to go to a treatment system. Even though it's aesthetic, uh, it can be a pain with those black stains. And then the last one is hydrogen sulfide or the rotten egg odor. Very common in certain shell formations. What happens is there's bacteria that are using the sulfur in the water. Uh, they reduce the sulfur and creates this odor, this gas, hydrogen sulfate. Uh, and there's ways to take care of it. Your nose is the best way to tell if you have it. Uh, some of these other parameters, um, we like to test to see what the levels of them are, but for hydrogen sulfide, it's a gas, it's hard to test. So we recommend your, no your nose is the best way to tell if you have it. So these are things that occur naturally in the aquifers in Pennsylvania. And how common are they? Well, about, 50% or 50% have corrosive water. The leaks, the copper, causes lead, copper leaks. About a little over 40% have hard water, which creates scale, soaping issues. And then you can see iron, about 20%. And this information is generated from surveys that we've done through Penn State Extension, research studies, uh, having water wells tested and seeing what levels of these parameters in their own water wells. So you can see it's, it's an issue, and you might have these issues.
And I know I get calls from people that have these issues because you'll know if there's an aesthetic issue. Uh, the irony is that health issues aren't going to show up in your water, but the aesthetic ones will. Okay, so these are just uh, some other charts showing some of the other ones, the pH, which is related to corrosivity, but not corrosivity is more than just pH, hardness, manganese. You can see where they fit in the spectrum of exceeding the standard uh, for these parameters. The other one is health-based issues, coliform bacteria being the most common one but also lead, E. coli, arsenic. Several years ago, they lowered the drinking water standard for arsenic. I know at the time when they did that, Honestel Water Authority was in violation. I think it's the 10 micrograms per liter for arsenic. Now, arsenic can occur both naturally as well as from man, human activities. In fact, one of the uh, way, uh, byproducts of, showing, of arsenic in old cemeteries, the embalming fluid. In fact, some lady called me from Lackawaxen by the Zane Gray had high arsenic and there's an old cemetery there. So that could be one of the causes for arsenic. So if you live near an old cemetery, you might want to consider testing the water for arsenic. It does have a health risk. Nitrates, we'll talk about that as well. Another fertile uh, nutrient that causes, uh, has health implications. So these are health-based. So other, other common contaminants, health standards, I, uh, you know, lead from corrosion, arsenic is, could be natural man-made, arsenic does occur naturally, volatile organics, pesticides. These are things that have health risks to you. And one of the things you want to know about them is, if are they being used in your area? Are you near a cemetery? Are you near a gas station? Are you near an agriculture area where they're using pesticides? Uh, you want to try and make sure if they are, that you can try and get those, what they are, and test for them. Because to test water is very expensive. You test for everything. So you want to narrow it down with potential contaminants is when you test your water. And a lot of them don't have a taste, smell, or color. You're not going to know they're there. That's the irony. The aesthetic things that you have an issue with that aren't going to cause health problems will show up in your water and you know they're there. So when we talk about drinking water standards and water testing, we recommend you test your water. Now, somebody asked earlier about self-testing. Self-testing basically means you can take a sample and send it to a lab. Why test? Many pollutants have no obvious symptoms. Bacteria, nitrates, you're not gonna know if they're in your water supply unless you test. About half of the private water supplies have never been properly tested. Use a certified lab. Use a certified lab. Do not get a home test kit from Home Depot or Lowe's or any other supplier. First of all, you cannot test bacteria with one of those tests. A lot of them are a strip that'll give you a color change. And depending on your eye, when that color change, you're not gonna get a numerical value. If you use a certified lab, you're gonna get a numerical value of that primary. Test before new activities for legal protection. This is happening up in the uh, Marcellus Shale, part of Pennsylvania. It's what we call chain of custody. Um, if you wanna ensure that you have these test results that it can be used as evidence, you wanna do a chain of custody where you have a third party taking the sample. If you just wanna use it to find out what's in your water and you have, don't have any issues with any kind of potential contaminants you anticipate in the immediate future, you can do it yourself. Um, but chain of custody is an added cost. That's a third party coming in to test, take the test. You're not taking the test. Usually it's the lab and not all labs do this. So you have to check with the lab. But that's if you think you're going to have some type of legal uh, lawsuit, uh, that information could be used in, in, in this testimony, that, that test results. What we recommend for testing, we recommend every 12 to 15 month, 14 months for bacteria. There are seasonal variations of bacteria, so if you do it every 14 months, you'll capture that seasonal variability. And then if you've never had your water tested and you test for some of the things that we recommend, like pH, total solids, nitrates, if you have any pollutants that are within that site of your well, you might want to test for those, and then test those every three years. You don't have to do those on an annual basis. Once you get your test results, you want to compare them to the standards for those different parameters, and we'll share what the, those would be. These standards give you an acceptable level of pollutant in your drinking water, but they're specific for the intended water use. E. coli, zero in, in wells, water supply. In a pond where you want to swim, you can have 126 colonies of E. coli. So each water use has different standards. Probably some of these other ones, they might be all the same. But for, just know for bacteria that there's different sta uh, standards for different uses. We have primary and secondary standards. Primary are a health risk. 
secondary or recommended maximum contaminant levels or static risk. The limits are set by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and in Pennsylvania, they're enforced by the State Department of Environmental Protection. That's only on public water systems only, restaurants, schools, community water supplies. So private water systems are not enforced. So that's why we recommend you test, just to get some idea of what your water quality is like. The units of measure, the most common one is milligrams per liter or parts per million. Some of the severe water quality parameters that have carcinogenic health risk, they would be in micrograms per liter like lead, um, arsenic, and their parts per billion. If you have a milligram per liter, you would then have a factor of a thousand or moving to decimal three. So say you have 0 .05, 0 0.05 milligrams per liter in micrograms per liter, that'd be 50. Just know that some test reports might give you it in one and you need to convert it to the other. Just know if you get them in micrograms and you need it in milligrams or vice versa, that's how you factor in the differences between those two units of measure. Other units, bacteria has what they call most probable number, or NPN, or colonies. pH has a number value. And then hardness is also sometimes in grains per gallon, in addition to milligrams per liter. So you're going to get, in a water test report, the units of measure are these different parameters. Like I said, primary standards are maximum contaminant levels. They cause health problems. They're enforced only for public water supplies. As a private water owner, unless uh, and let me rephrase that. As a private water system, even if you have a health department or a township ordinance, they're not going to talk about water testing a lot. They're not going to have standards in there for water testing. That's one of the factors that's normally not in those regulations. They might tell you to put in grout or a sanitary well cap. Very few of them will have any kind of language of water testing. So that's all important for you to test your water. There are about 80 pollutants that have a primary drinking water standard. They run from PCBs to CCE to bacteria, to nitrates to arsenic to lead and so forth. And then we have secondary standards, which are related to aesthetic issues. You know, the water tastes bad, there's an odor, it's staining my water fixtures. And these are like iron, hydrogen sulfide, sodium. Um, iron has a secondary standard of 0.3. It may occur naturally, or it could be if you're in a heavily mined area where they disturb the aquifer through below ground mining and create acid mine issues, then you could have higher levels of iron. It's a reddish stain and metallic taste once you get above that standard of 0.3 milligrams per liter. Coliform bacteria, the most common parameter that we see in private water systems. We use coliform bacteria as an indicator organism. Coliform bacteria normally does not live in groundwater. It's a surface water organism. So if coliform bacteria is in your water supply, that means there's a connection between the surface and your groundwater. It can occur from runoff around that space that we talked about, that annular space around the casing. It could be from insects living up under the wall cap and getting down into the water supply. Um, or, you know, or it could be a failing septic system, uh, close by to the well and so forth. They cause flu-like symptoms and about all the private water systems that we've tested, a part of our research study, about a third, and this can be then translated statewide, fail for coliform bacteria. If they have coliform bacteria, then they see if any of them are of the E. coli strain. And E. coli is found in, like I said, the gut of all warm-blooded animals. E. coli found in humans is different from the E. coli in deer. Not many labs differentiate between E. coli. Most of them will just give you E. coli in general. But E. coli has about 12% failure. And that also has a problem because people have died over the years from E. coli. Now, not all E. coli strain, strains are the same. Some are more severe, but you shouldn't have any. Why risk having a strain that maybe is not going to cause a problem? You don't know that. So you can't have any bacteria in your water supply. And this picture is just showing the old ways of a Petri dish. When they test for bacteria, they need to have it sampled within 30 hours of the sample being taken. So we, people call us about water testing. And unfortunately, with Penn State Extension and Pike County being shut down, our water testing through our local a lab in Monroe County, because there are no certified labs in Pike County, 
It's not happening. We do have the bottles and people can pick them up if they have to drive them to the lab themselves. We also have the Penn State lab, which we have test kits, but you have to mail them unless you want to drive three, three and a half hours out to Penn State. Um, but if you do a bacteria sample, you have to get it to the lab within 30 hours of the sample being taken. Then they run a test for 24 hours in an incubator and then they look at the results and make a determination whether any colonies of bacteria were there. So these are, this is the most common parameter that people fail in their wells. And it's amazing, you know, like I said, that one in Walker Lake that had the standard cap that those insects had coliform bacteria. Way back in the beginning of the presentation, we had some of the construction features. If you have all of them, you reduce the chance of bacteria contamination. If you have none, you can see it's, it's over 50% for coliform and maybe 35, 37% for E. coli. As you implement these features, such as the sanitary well cap, sloping it away from the casing, casing a foot of more, 12 feet, or 12 feet, 12 inches, a foot. The grout seal, which is the one that's hard to do, you can't retrofit it, as well as um, casing to bed, the, the bedrock. So the more you have of these, then you would the greater the reduction of your risk of having bacteria in your water supply. That being said, you can still get it. In 23 years I've lived in my house, I've had three contaminations of coliform bacteria. So it can occur, even with a sanitary wall cap. So that's why it's important to test your water supply periodically. The other common uh, health risk is nitrates. It's a Nutrients originates in fertilizers or from animal or human waste. If you go down to Lancaster County or even Northampton, Lehigh, Southeast, South Central PA, there's a lot of heavily agricultural areas and you have a lot of nitrates in the water. Uh, they exceed the 10 milligrams per liter, which is a standard in many wells because they have just so much manure and uh, a lot of it's not getting treated properly and it's ending up in streams or being put on the ground and seeping into the groundwater. It could be nitrate or nitrite. A nitrate standard is 10 milligrams per liter. And the reason we have a standard for nitrates of 10, children under the age of about 15 months, uh, if they drink water with high nitrates, can turn blue because basically the um, nitrates uh, interfere with the hemoglobin in the blood that they're carrying the oxygen, so the baby is not getting the oxygen. It's, it's um, it's switching, the nitrates are switching over and causing that, but the babies aren't getting oxygen. So it's called methahemoglobin or blue baby syndrome. So it's very, you know, so that's why we have it. You and I can drink it and we're not gonna be affected, but, but if you have high nitrates and you have a, an infant using the water, potential is there for blue baby syndrome. So that's why I have a standard of 10 milligrams per liter. Around here in Pike County, the highest I've ever seen was five. Ironically, that was in the, um, I think the school, the Lower Valley School System, uh, that used to be a turkey farm many years ago, and I think a legacy of that turkey farm and all the high night you know, bird waste has, is heavily with nitrates in it, and it probably is left left in the soil and the ground. So, but most most people around here are below below ten milligrams per liter. So, how do you know what to test your water for? Well, you might have heard me talk earlier that. What is happening around you? So do you have a residential area? So you might want to test for bacteria, nitrates, pH, um, maybe turbidity, depending on how much land clearance activity, agriculture areas, bacteria, nitrates, pesticides. If it's industrial activity, what type of things are being used in that plant? Landfills, dumps, you know, um, organics, depending on what's dumped there, gas, oil wells, maybe barium. Mining, you know, iron, bacteria. Bacteria seems to be prominent in all these. So it just depends on what's around you of what might be getting into your water supply. And you need to know that in order to keep the cost of the test within reason uh, financially for you. Because one of the things, if you test for everything, you're probably going to get a lot of not detected. Uh, this equipment they use to test these parameters have a, has a sensitivity level. So if the parameter is not there, they can't pick it up because of that sensitivity level of that piece of equipment. So you're getting not detected or less than whatever the level, sensitivity level is of that uh, testing equipment. And we'll, we'll show that in a picture. So Here, as I, we have a yes. question. Uh, mm -hmm. Wayne would like to know how long after fertilizing should nitrates disappear from your water testing analysis? Well, uh, <laughs> 
hopefully um, they're going to be used up by the plants. When we, when, one of the things we do at Penn State Extension is we do a lot of soil test kits. So if anybody's interested in fertilizing or using some type of fertilizer, we recommend they test the soil to see what those nutrient levels are, um, whether you need to put them on. Uh, so they should break down uh, within being used by the plants if they're, if they're using for a lot of nitrates. If they're using with 100, within 100 feet of their well casing, uh, potentially uh, they could get into the water, groundwater supply. So uh, I don't know if there's a threshold where they'll break down before it gets into the groundwater. I think most cases they will be used by the plants if they're used in the right amount for those plants, the requirements of those plants. So most people will fertilize to, you know, fertilize a plant. So you need to know what the plant is and how much fertilizer it needs. If it's a lawn, um, you need to know that. If your wall casing is in your lawn, I would recommend you don't fertilize within 100 feet of that. So I don't know if that answers that question because uh, I don't really, I don't know what the rate of it breaking down through the soil, but soil will use it up. The plants, the roots will take it up as, as a nutrient. Uh, so you need to be cognizant and aware of how much you need for that type of plant. And also we recommend testing the soil to see what the existing nitrate levels are. So if that doesn't answer his question, maybe you can, they can repeat that. Uh, he, that he says that does answer his question. That was okay. Um, okay. And then we have okay. another one that says, are there any known local contaminants near military bases? It's interesting you ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar, people familiar with the Toby Hanna Army Depot? Several years ago, they were, they had, they had, uh, in fact, there used to be apartments across the Toby Hanna Army Depot and had TCE get in the water supply from that plant. So uh, that's one I know of. I don't know of other plants like uh, Picatinny over in Jersey, I'm not sure. Other thing is, um, Lack Waxing a few years ago, there was some illegal dumping up off of, um, kind of past the township building. There's an old quarry back there. I forget the name of that road there off of 590. And somebody was coming in at night and dumping waste and there was a PCB. And I think about half a dozen wells got contaminated with PCB. So you got to worry about illegal dumping as well. <laughs> so if you see something, uh, alert um, probably the DEP and um, let them investigate it because their potential is that illegal dumping can cause problems. So with regard to the military bases, it, uh, the only one in the area that I'm aware of is Toby Hanna and they had a TCE issue. And, they, and what's TCE again? It uh, trichloro something. It's a, a grease I think they were using in production of some of the uh, production process at the plant and it got into the groundwater because it wasn't being handled properly. So um, I'm not sure what, you know, the, oh, well, the other one is the new one, the PV, PVBA, I forget what that means. There's the PFABs. I know now they're starting to see PFABs at military installations. Um, and I, we have a whole fact sheet on that. I'm, I, I, I'm, I have a little bit of information, but not a lot, but we had a we even had a webinar from Penn State Extension on that, but that's something else. So the only one I'm aware of locally was at TC at the Toby Hanna, but you know there could be things used in production of the uh, of the base that potentially, if it's not being handled properly, could get into the groundwater. Uh, so when you talk about understanding your your test results, as I mentioned, primary maximum contaminant levels for bacteria at zero, about 80 of these exist. They give you the acceptable level of pollutants. So research and scientific study has shown that no bacteria are acceptable. Nitrates, the limit is 10. So through research, children drinking water with eight parts per million or eight milligrams per liter of nitrates, they're fine. Lead, 15 parts per billion or 15 micrograms per liter. So scientific studies on these parameters have shown that that's an all right acceptable level of, of that pollutant in your water. The secondary or the recommended maximum contaminant levels uh, are for aesthetic issues. So pH, we have a range of six and a half to eight and a half. When you get below 6.5, you start getting acidic water and you could have corrosive water. Iron, you start above three parts per million seeing symptoms in your water supply. Total dissolved solids, 500 parts per million, you get above that, you start getting taste issues with your water. And we have a lot of fact sheets and our website, which is the last slide you'll be seeing and you'll be getting a PDF of the slides, has a lot of information on the fact sheets on the water, drinking water component of our website. 
So if you have a problem with your water, if you have bacteria, if you have iron, if you have copper, you can take care of it, especially if it's a health risk. So one thing might be a new source. And that could be if there's a community water system in close proximity, maybe you wanna hook into that. If you have a large enough property, you could um, drill a new another well. You might be in the same aquifer, so that might not be an alternative you wanna select. But you could look for a new source of water, maybe put in a cistern. I didn't talk about cisterns. Cisterns basically are tanks that collect a roof runoff. Uh, they're also prone to bacteria and other waste because of what the water is carrying off the roof. But in some parts of Pennsylvania, the groundwater is so heavily polluted that they use cisterns to collect their water. It is also dependent on rainfall. So if you have a drought, you're going to have less water into your tank. Uh, so there, that's a new source. Um, pollution control. That would be if you had that standard well cap, put on a sanitary well cap. Keeping a standard well cap on, shocking the well for chlorinating it, shock chlorinating the other bacteria, keeping a standard well cap in on is not going to solve the problem. You're not getting rid of the pollution source, which is the insects and the mice potentially living under there. So you want to replace it. That's pollution control. Uh, maintenance or repairs, uh, the person who had a problem with the casing, maybe uh, your casing needs to be replaced, um, pitless adapter. Um, the other thing for pollution control is if you're, you know, if you have, if you identified a nutrient, nitrates, and you had a lot of fertilizer, pollution control is removing them 100 feet away from your well, and hopefully that'll alleviate the problem. The fourth bullet is treatment. I mean, you can treat anything in water. The problem is there's no one singular option for treatment, but you can go to treatment like I have in my house, or you can look at bottled water. Some of these parameters, you're, not gonna, you're only going to get them from drinking water. They're not going to affect you. Like bacteria, you can still shower in. Um, it's not going to get in your skin. The only way potentially is if you have a cut, maybe E. coli could get into your skin. But most cases, you're going to ingest it by drinking, drinking it. So uh, you can go to bottled water and maybe use other water for other purposes besides drinking. But you want to look at all these options before you take action. So we have, we have another question. Sure. Uh, we have a shocking question. Uh, <laughs> someone would like to know, how do you shock a well and can homeowners do it? Okay, yeah, well, you can. I've done, like I said, I've done it three times at my well. Um, basically, if you have a bacteria contamination and, and if you have small amounts of bacteria, it could be a sampling error. So you might, you know, I. I when you take a bacteria sample, I accidentally stuck my finger once in, so it came back positive. You don't want to put the cap down on the counter where there's bacteria that could get into the water supply. You want to be careful taking the sample. So there's some sampling error that could occur. Now, the lab that we used to process when we were open had an absence presence. The Penn State lab uses gives you a numerical value. So if you go through Penn State and you get one colony of coliform, you know, maybe retest it again. That would be my recommendation. Because shocking can have some implications on the pump and, and, and the pitless adapter. But basically, anybody can shock a well. And it's taking chlorine bleach and diluting it about an 8 to 1 ratio and pouring that down the casing. Um, and then and we have a fact sheet on this. And then running a, uh, a hose on the inside of the casing just to get any water that might have stuck to the casing when you're pouring it down, down into the well. So for most wells, it's usually about a little over half a gallon of water, or a quarter of chlorine bleach. So not many people have a four bucket, so you might have to do two gallons at a time. So it's an eight to one, usually for about, it's about four gallons of water to half a gallon of chlorine bleach. Then you would run your water in your house for about 10 minutes, uh, stop, and run all faucets. Because what happens is you want water in your well, into your house and you might, and you have a tank in your house with water. So you want to use up that water first before you kick on your pump to get that water distributed throughout the house. Uh, you just want to get a nice chlorine smell. Shouldn't knock you out. Don't, you, know, you don't want to use too much. And then you do that for a couple days and then you test it maybe seven to 10 days later. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, and you don't want to do it too frequently because you don't want to use it as a treatment option. If you constantly get a bacteria 
positive. You don't want to use shock chlorination as a treatment option because it does have uh, bleach is very toxic and corrosive and could affect the parts of your private water system. So that's basically what shocking shocking is. And we have a fact sheet on that. And if that person wants to get in touch with me, we can get them that fact sheet. So when we do water treatment, you want to base it on an independent certified lab result. You want to have the numerical value of that parameter. You want to match a pollutant with the correct process. You may need more than one treatment depending on how many parameters you have an issue with. A little over half of our private water systems on one of those have some type of treatment. Uh, the most common are sediment filters and water softeners. It's amazing how many people have water softeners. Probably some of them are unnecessary. About 10% are unnecessary. In fact, the lady put one on and she already had soft water. She didn't have hard water. A lot knowing if you have a system like I do, you have to maintain as maintenance is required for a lot of these systems. And if you want to see if it's working, um, well, you can test the water before and after treatment. I know when I put my system into my home, I test the water coming out of my tap to see if the parameter was taken care of through the treatment option. Um, if you inherit a home with one and you're not sure, you could test raw water to see what the levels of the parameter, if you can identify the system that was installed and what it's supposed to be treating. You can find out what the raw levels are and you can then test afterwards to find out what the levels are and see if the treatment system working, but that's your choice. So, um, coliform bacteria, and E. coli. Um, presence absent test, it's most labs do it, but you would like to see maybe a numerical value. As I mentioned, about a third fail statewide, 10% for E. coli. Some of the solutions uh, eliminating the source around your well or spring. So if you have that well cap, that standard with those insects, remove the standard cap, get rid of all the insects, put in a sanitary cap. Uh, then maybe shock the well, depending on the numerical values that you have. If it's low, you might just want to retest. Maybe there was some type of error. Um, so that's one way then for you to treat it. Uh, other ways, you know, simple ways, boiling, shock chlorination, Continuous chlorination is what they use in community systems. Like I said, the shock chlorination, if it keeps, bacteria keeps coming back, then you have a constant source. And then that last bullet there, you might have to go to a UV light with a sediment filter. There are about $700. The bulb on that UV light has to be replaced annually. It might still be on after a year, but its intensity diminishes. And once its intensity diminishes, it's not gonna be as effective in zapping the bacteria. You also want to have a sediment filter to keep any turbidity out of the water because that turbidity can then mask the bacteria, the UV light from getting or zapping the bacteria. These pictures just show what they look like when I, I've done programs because I have an incub incubator in my office and I've done some programs where we've tested water. The top one is the coliform, the bluish tinge would be E. coli. And they both cause flu like symptoms or gastrointestinal issues. So bacteria have been very common. It's one we recommend you test for. If you have any, there are different ways that you can get, try and alleviate the bacteria. If it's a reoccurring, like I said, you're gonna to have to go to some type of treatment. And UV light is the most common treatment for private water systems. pH measures the acidity or basic nature of water. And rain naturally is acidic. We've heard of the term acid rain. So rainfall is on the acidic side. It's controlled by the bedrock where the water originates. We have a lot of soft water here in, the, in Pike County in Northeastern PA, we recommend that your level be between six and a half, eight and a half. pH of my water is five, nine. So I know I have corrosive water. 20% of private water supplies have low pH. Fewer on the basic, uh, being above eight and a half is not as severe as being below six and a half. So if you have a little bit over eight and a half, that's normally not an issue, but it's the acidic nature of the water. Low pH, as I mentioned, causes corrosion, taste issues, especially with metal plumbing. So one way to alleviate it is go to pl uh, plastic plumbing. Copper and lead are a concern in that metal. In the early 90s, they uh, went from lead-free solder, but who knows, maybe some plumbers had some old solder and they were using it and that contained lead. So you could have a home in the mid 90s and still potentially have lead. Uh, there are two treatment options. Uh, acid neutralizing filter or soda ash injection. I have an acid neutralizing filter in my house. It has limestone chips or a base material. The water flows through it. When it comes out of the tank, it's at a higher pH. And the water with a higher pH goes through the house, 
and doesn't corrode the metal pipes. I know it works because I've had the last four years, I've had three pinhole leaks in the pipes before they get to the treatment system in my home. So I know I have corrosive water because I've had three pinhole leaks. Now I have PEX pipe there, but that's a pipe that's getting before the treatment, after the treatment. Because you know, one of the issues I had was I didn't want to have pinhole leaks occurring in my pipe and having to rip up all the walls to replace the pipe. So uh, if you have the blue-green stains, which is that picture in the, around the sink is one of the telltale signs as well as metallic taste and I had both of them. So we have a lot of so, uh, soft water here. And one of the things of that is it's corrosive and can leach lead and copper out of your pipes. Those off solids is another parameter we recommend testing for. It measures all the dissolved ions in the water. It's like the doctor taking your temperature. It contains all dissolved ions. It could be from the nitrates, it could be from the copper, iron, manganese, calcium, magnesium, sodium chloride. These are all things that could be in your water supply. The level is 500 milligrams per liter. As you get above that, you start getting taste and staining. The issue with TDS is the reason we recommend you test that periodically. You don't want to see large changes in tozol solids. If you're starting to see changes and something's happening, in the aquifer or something's being affected. If you do have high TDS, you can, and it's mostly since a taste issue, you can what we call point of entry, no, point of use. Treatment can, can, is either point of entry, like my neutralizing filter, it treats all the watering in the house. You can do point of use, which would be like under your sink. And this picture is showing a reverse osmosis unit, which will remove the high levels of TDS. Normally they're placed under the sink and that can then treat, treat the water. T, uh, reverse osmosis will also work for arsenic as well as nitrates. And um, since it's a taste issue, and drinking issue for those parameters, um, you want to do it where the water is being used underneath the sink. Nitrate, nitrin, nitrates, usually from, it's a, since it's a nutrient, usually from fertilizers, it could be Manures, septic system. I know, like I said, in the agriculture area, they have high levels of nitrates from the manure waste. It can cause blue baby disease. Uh, disease. The limit is 10 milligrams per liter. About 5% of the water samples exceed that. Some of the solutions, looking at reducing the source, trying to identify where the nitrates are coming from. Having children and pregnant women, if there are high levels of nitrates and you don't want to go to a treatment option drinking bottled water, and then uh, several options for treatment or anion exchange where you exchange the nitrates with another, um, another uh, parameter, uh, reverse osmosis, which is a, media, a membrane that prevents the nitrates from getting into the water. So these are a couple of treatment options that you consider. Like I said, a lot of them will be at the entry or at the use where the water is being used in the house. Corrosivity, um, it's it's complex. It's not just the uh, low pH. There are other factors like toes off solids. It's a combination of acidic soft water. It causes that water to leach the metals out of the pipe, causing the blue stains or copper. Lead has no stains, but a lot of our soldering in our homes are lead. It's very toxic, 50 micrograms per liter, and there's no symptoms of water. So these are some of the parameters, especially that, that lead that you want to be concerned about. And the copper as well, because you don't want to get those pinhole leaks in your pipes. Uh, copper is nearly always, if you have copper in your water, it's not normally going to be from your groundwater. It's going to be from the plumbing system. And when you test, if you, if you have those blue-green stains, what you want to do is you want to do the first draw. Water sitting overnight in your pipes is going to leach that copper out. So the first draw is the water sitting overnight. So you want to capture the water before the first draw. So you want to get it without running it. These other parameters, you want to run the water for a few minutes. So when you want to test for lead and copper, we recommend first draw, where you get the water sitting overnight, because that's going to have the highest level. Copper causes gastrointestinal effects above 1.3 milligrams per liter. Once you get to one, you're going to get poor tasting water. My copper was like 6.9 when I tested it. Uh, about 19%, that's in the Zern County. Well, I don't know what the percentage is. That's a, unfortunately another slide. But we do have a lot of it here in Pike County. Now, one of the things you can do, say you get copper and you don't have those blue-green stains and you test for copper and it's just above the threshold. Uh, one of the things you could do is you can run the water in the morning, 
get that water that's sitting overnight out of the system and then use the water and then you probably have lower levels of copper and lead. Uh, so that's calling flushing the pipes. And it's 95% effective. There are some things with it because you're using water, you're wasting water, but you're running it, depending on how, uh, how much is sitting overnight. You can go to corrosion control, um, which is what I have, which I have um, a neutralizing filter that's um, taking the corrosive water out and putting non corrosive water into my pipes. You can go to plastic pipes, that could be expensive. Uh, you could use reverse osmosis for that taste issue. Um, but it's not going to address your plumbing damage because it's used, unless you have reverse osmosis as a point of entry versus a point of use. Or you can go to bottled water. Just knowing if your copper net is very high, the concern is those pinhole leaks that over time could then start to show up. And if they show up behind your, or the plumbing behind your walls, you can have a very expensive uh, fix to that. Lead. Always comes from plumbing systems, measures its first draw just like copper, causes many health effects, especially for young children. It affects the nervous system. The drinking water standard is uh, 0.015 milligrams per liter or um, 15 parts per or mic micrograms per liter. Similar to copper, you can flush the pipes, go to corrosion control, go to plastic pipes. So, you know, if your home was after the early 90s, um, you still might have some lead in it. So you might want to test if you see if you have the corrosive water or reverse osmosis or go to bottle water. Uh, the opposite of corrosive water is hardness. It's mostly with calcium and magnesium. It causes aesthetic problems, white residue, soaping up's an issue, burned out hot water units. These are at this table showing the different values of hardness and what, you know, if you start getting over, start getting over 120, then you're starting to have issues. I mean, you can have hardness, up to that point, moderately hard is not too much of an issue. My hardness has gone up. I've created a hard, little harder water because of my corrosion control, but I'm not going to put a softener in, which is one way to cure hardness because it would kind of neutralize the, the neutralizing filter. And so one way to treat for hardness is softeners. Uh, manganese, which is a black uh, stain, poor taste. Uh, it's not a health issue, but it can be an annoyance. It's more common, increased problem due to mining, but we do have people around here that have manganese. Um, we talked about iron, hydrogen sulfide. Um, getting back to, to um, iron and manganese, uh, one of the ways to treat iron and manganese, uh, there's several ways. First of all, you need to know the level. We have a fact sheet on that. Uh, small amounts, you can use softeners. The issue with softeners for some people is your using sodium. So if you're on a salt restricted diet and you're using sodium as a medium, you're getting additional salt in your water. But so softeners for hardness will remove this, the, the calcium and magnesium and replace it with sodium. Uh, softeners for levels of iron will, do, will remove the iron and replace it with sodium. If you have high levels of iron and manganese, there's other systems called oxidizing filters, which you oxidize the lead and copper and then you fill oh, iron and manganese and then you filter it out uh, afterwards. So these are two common treatment options. Uh, they are expensive and it's all on you to pay for that cost. There are no government programs to help you pay for your cost of your water treatments. Uh, Oxidizing oxide filters also work for hydrogen sulfide. Some people have tried to shock a well because it is a bacterial issue. Bacteria is causing this gas, but it can reoccur. And like I said, long-term shocking of the well is not good for the system, but it does, can be removed by oxidizing the filters. And we have a fact sheet on hydrogen sulfide as well. So finally, we wanna talk about a water test result. So if you test your water, you're gonna get a complicated report like this. And we'll try and make it easy to understand. There's different columns. First column is showing you the parameter you had your water tested for. So in this case, bacteria, cadmium, barium, arsenic, so forth. The second column is a unit. So the TDS, the arsenic, most of them are in milligrams per liter. The pH is in a numerical value. And the bacteria is most probable number. The third column is the test results. This is what was in the water of those parameters. So I had 18 colonies of coliform. The pH is 8.1. The arsenic was 0.022. And the other one C is less than. 
those parameters were below the threshold or the sensitivity level of the treatment equipment or the amount of treatment, the uh, testing equipment. So they didn't pick up any of those parameters. The next column is a standard. So bacteria zero. So obviously this water test result exceeded zero, it was 18. The arsenic is 0 0.01, so 0 0.022 exceeds that. The rest of the parameters were below the standard. The last column is the uh, type of standard. We talked about health standards or aesthetics. So pH and total soil solids an aesthetic issue. Uh, the rest of them are health issues. And then the last column is the treatment method they use, which really doesn't mean too much to you or I. So you're gonna get a report like this uh, from every lab. It might be a little different from lab to lab. This is a Penn State labs report. So if you get your water tested through any lab and you have questions, about the test results, feel free to reach out to me. We can uh, interpret those test results for you. I know we've been on a while, oh gosh, well, over an hour. So this is our website, uh, print screen. This is a, the website. We have a section in the upper left of this, uh, of here on drinking residential water, which has all our fact sheets, courses, videos, so forth. So, I have one more poll question, if you could pull that up, Devin. It's this on the next one, if you could just fill this out. Should be up on everybody's screen. Hopefully they see it, yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate uh, spend, everybody spending the time on this topic today, hopefully, um, you learned something that you could use with regard to your private water supply. I know we have time. If there's any more questions that you didn't get to ask during the presentation, um, this is the last slide. I'm gonna. There's my contact information. That number is not. Well, that's our office number. I have Jabber on my computer, so if you call that number or some, you know, it'll come right to my computer or to my cell phone since we're working from home, but there's a way to email me. I'm gonna stop sharing the slides. I know I'll get these as a PDF to uh, Devin and then she can mm -hmm. share yeah. at the I'm, end. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen okay. uh, just to show you guys. Um, if you missed our previous, oops, it's not showing the right thing. Sorry about that. Um, if you missed our previous Ways to Help Your Lake Stay Healthy webinars, uh, you can go to our website and under Education, you can see Ways to Help Your Lake Stay Healthy series and all of our webinars, including today's, will be available on that page. And if you registered for today's event, I will also be sending out an email with the PDF of today's presentation, as well as links to all of these presentations that we've had throughout this series. Well, I don't know, Wayne asked about Superfund sites. Uh, hi, Wayne, hope you're doing well. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, you would probably go through the uh, Environmental Protection Agency or the DEP to find out if there's any Superfund sites within Northeast PA. I imagine there are. We have a history of uh, industrial activity. Luckily, we don't have any in Pike County, but there are other counties in Northeast PA that have industrial. So I'm not aware of any, there are probably some. Well, I imagine that one in Lack Waxen became a mini Superfund site and they had to clean that up with the PCBs. I think another one several years ago was where they uh, put the, um, oh, the river view, whatever. When you go on 84 to the right, it's going to Delaware, across the Delaware River into New York State. I know they were dumping stuff there when I first moved here back in the mid eighties, but, um, I would think that um, those agencies would have a list of those sites. I'm not aware of any specific sites. Okay, Rachel wanted to, yeah, you put up the website. Rachel wanted to know about the uh, GWIS. Um, I, mean, I, can try, <laughs> I can try and pull it up on my computer if that's what she's asking about. Um, she said she tried to find one. Um, I know it's comp, it's not easy. Finding that site. Let me see. I 
I know the home page. Let me see if I can do it and share. Um, okay. So let me share my screen and we'll see how this goes. This could be successful, it could not be. Uh, where is it? Chat Microsoft Teams. Mm. Here we go. Uh, Peter, someone just had a quick question. She said, um, will the Penn State Extension website, the one that I shared, have the contact information to get your water tested? That, well, I know DEP has a website and I can share with people of Certify Labs by County. The Penn State Lab would also be on there through the analytical lab, they do water testing for drinking water as well as pond. So if somebody's looking for a lab, I can, I don't think that list is on our website because it's constantly being updated. And when you look at a lab, you want to make sure that they're certified for the parameter you want to have your water tested for. Not all labs are certified for all parameters. So I can, um, sh I can share with you, I think I have it as an, I don't know if it's a PDF or Excel of that list. Oh, I think it was from last fall. But um, DEP also would have it. But I don't think our website has that list because it's constantly being changed. So um, that's what they're asking. There are no certified labs in the area. There's not in Pike County. There are a few. I think there's a couple in Lackawanna County. There's a Princeton Analytics. There's Microback has a lab. I know Prosser's in Monroe County. I don't think there's any in Wayne County. Uh, so I can share that list, or if somebody wants to contact me uh, and wants to know where some labs are. But I don't think we have that list on our website. Okay, um, I don't know, I'm on here. So here, I don't know if anybody's seeing this. I'm gonna go to Pike. Uh, I'll go to my township, Shahola. I know my driller name. And if you know when it was drilled, I guess you could put zero, one. No, maybe I'll make that. I think I did this for mine. Zero, one point two. I'll try that date. And if I'm Dave Weber. The wall owner is probably going to be the person who had the house. It wasn't me because I didn't buy it new. And I think, no, I'm trying to remember this, Rachel, how you, because Brian might explain this to you, whether you, okay, let's see what I get. So you're probably, I don't know if you're seeing the Excel document, probably not. <laughs> so I got an Excel document showing all the wells that's going to, in Shahola Township, drilled by Dave Weber between those dates. So I don't know if Rachel, you got to that point where you got an Excel document when you clicked on download data package, any records? Maybe she wants to turn on her mic. She can talk. We can talk. <laughs> yeah, here I'll let her. <laughs> because I'd have to. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you're very faint, but we can hear you. Thank you so much. Um, I maybe made the mistake of looking at the map and did not download the data package. So I will try that. Yeah, I got an Excel document showing all the well drill, bleh, all the wells drilled in Charlotte Township by Dave Weber between those dates I put in there. And one of them, one of them was mine because the people I bought the home from, I knew, so <laughs> they're listed there. So, so yes. Yeah, so. Do you think this would work if someone didn't know the driller name? Oh yeah, they just get a larger list of all the wells drilled. Oh. I just knew to. Well, yeah, the more information you have, the the less of a hit you're going to get. Gotcha. So you have to filter, you have to filter through. Okay, thank you. I didn't want to take too much of your time. I oh, that's all right. If anyone else so wanted to use it, we could all learn at once. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, so that's how you find out about it. I'm going to stop sharing there. I don't know if there's any other questions. Any other questions? 
We log out. Well, I appreciate okay. everybody's time. If you have any follow-ups or if you get a water test or want to get a water test, like I said, our office is not taking the samples. You can pick up test kits for Prosser and you have to drive the Prosser. Or you could find another lab, but that means you have to go to a lab, pick up the, you just can't go to a lab with a glass jar. You have to get the, the sterilized plastic containers in the lab to test your water. You can't come with a, a jar and say, here's my water tested. Because the bacteria have a special bottle which is sealed and has a tablet in it, which is a, uh, takes any kind of residual chlorine if there's any in the water out of it. Um, or you can use a Penn State lab. We have those test kits, but that has to be mailed. And anytime you mail water, especially if you want to have bacteria tested, you have to mail it overnight. And water is not cheap. <laughs> it's not like mailing a, a bill. There's a weight to it, and you're going to pay for the weight even through a UPS or UPS or United States or FedEx or whatever. So, um, but that's an option. All right. So, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you to Peter for teaching us all about our drinking water. And we hope to see you all at some future Pike County events. Check in on our website, pikeconservation.org, to see any future events that we have coming up.